What testing should be done to confirm an AML diagnosis? So first of all, one has to do a bone marrow, aspirate, and biopsy. So that's standard. And then the hematopathologist will look at the smear and at the biopsy and identify these blasts. And we will call it AML if there are certain markers positive, so so-called myeloid markers. So how is that being done in the old days? More by staining with antibodies on the slide. And for many years, this is done by flow cytometry. Uh, we will explain what that is. So <clears throat> we have a very vast panel of markers on these cells that we can identify with so-called monoclonal antibodies. So these are antibodies that bind to receptors on the surface of the leukemic cell, and we can quantitate that. How many of these receptors do we have per cell? <clears throat> so this is called immunophenotyping, and this will tell us the cell of origin, perhaps, and <clears throat> how mature, how differentiated leukemic cell is, and are these really myeloid leukemias. So not so long ago, the uh, false diagnostics was about 30%. So 30% of patients were not correctly diagnosed. And that has vastly improved because of the you know, use by flow cytom of flow cytometry. So <clears throat> the diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia was um, imperfect two or three decades ago. And up to 30% of patients who came to MD Anderson had to be reclassified. So that number is way down now because of the right use of flow cytometry where we are checking for antigens expressed on the surface of the leukemic cells to make sure these are myeloid cells and not lymphoid cells or some other cells. So we have a very vast panel of antibodies, reagents, that labeled with a fluorescent marker, and um, this can be quantitated by flow cytometry. Uh, so that's the next important step, and pathologists always use these markers to call it AML and subtypes of AML. The next testing now is molecular. So it started with chromosome analysis, uh, so-called cytogenetics is still very, very useful. So we are looking at chromosomes and changes in chromosomes, breaks in chromosomes, fusion of different chromosomes. Um, for instance, BCI-ABLE, which is uh, two genes that are fused and they give rise to a 922 translocation, which is found in chronic myeloid leukemia, but also in some acute myeloid leukemias. Um, other abnormalities would be uh, trisomy 8, so chromosome 8 is not present in two copies, but in three copies. Uh, other changes would be uh, short arm of chromosome 17, losses of pieces of chromosome 5 and 7, or the entire loss of chromosome 5 and 7, and so on. So it's very complicated in the end, but <clears throat> not all patients have all these abnormalities, and <clears throat> it gives us a very good idea uh, already about the prognosis based on these chromosome analyses. So the next step then is DNA sequencing. So we uh, have a panel of right now uh, 81 <clears throat> mutations that we are looking at routinely. Um, one could also sequence the entire exome, that means all the expressed, all the uh, genes, but that is too cumbersome. And so we have a panel of 81 uh, genes, which covers the vast majority of what is known to be mutated in AML. So now we're looking at mutations. Uh, I mentioned already Flick 3 mutation, which comes in different flavors, <clears throat> which are important for the specific drugs that we use. <clears throat> there are so-called IDH mutations. Uh, we have drugs specifically for these mutations. Um, there are uh, mutations in genes like uh, RANX1, like P53 again, uh, which I said is the worst. And so we have a whole panel of mutations, and they help us 
nailing down the diagnosis. And now we are classifying the AMLs uh, increasingly more based on uh, mutations. And this is directly correlated with prognosis. And to make a bad prognosis group into a good prognosis group, we need targeted treatments. And I mentioned the FLIX3 leukemias, uh, which were very bad before and have vastly improved by uh, quite a number of targeted therapies. All this takes a long time. All this takes 20 years. Each drug has a history of 20 years, at least, from the development to early clinical trials, and if successful, then to FDA approval. Uh, so these things don't happen overnight. There's a lot of preclinical work, a lot of chemistry, a lot of optimization of drugs involved. But in the end, uh, we have an ever-increasing number of specific therapies that are usually targeted to particular mutations, but not all of them. So that, I think, is the diagnostic workup which uh, leads directly to treatment decisions. There's one more technique called FISH, <coughs> fluorescence in situ hybridization, which we also pioneered 30 years ago, and it's used routinely and detects uh, chromosomal abnormalities that cannot be detected by conventional microscopy of chromosomes. Mm -hmm.